Welcome, Internet. Welcome Internet. We are on. Oh, someone's echoing real quick. Probably just Derek. We are on TIG Radio number uh, seven. Seven, eight, nine. No, seven. It's number seven. Nine, and nine. our guest for the hour is none other than Derek Yu. Hello, hello. Hey, Derek. Hey, Derek. Hi. Hey, guys. Hey, uh, so for, for the for the nub that might be listening, who are you? What do you do, Derek? Uh, I'm Derek Yu. I run Tig Source. I worked on Aquaria with the great Alec Holoka, and I'm working on Spelunky right now for the Xbox Live Arcades. That's like them uh, download Xboxes? <laughs> it is, it is. Have it's you announced any kind of schedule for that, or is it just kind of when it's good and ready to... Knock your socks off. When it's good and ready, but it's probably going to be like the sec, the last part of this year. So I would like, like it not to go <clears throat> past that. Yes. Sweet. And is is it just you, or are you collaborating with other people on it? Uh, right now, I uh, my friend Andy is helping me out. Um, and he he did uh, what's bothering Carl. That illustrated the storybook, and he's also working on a game called Heatline, which he posted cool. on uh, on Tig Forms. So, so yeah. is is he helping more for the tech stuff? Because you did Spelunky is a game maker game, right? It is, and yeah, no, I'm. We're actually both doing about equal amounts of programming um, on this one. So I do have like I do have a computer science degree, so I'm actually putting it to some use now. And, <laughs> Nice. He says as he straightens his tie, I do have a computer. <laughs> <laughs> I'm adjusting How's it coming my, along? Uh, you know, it's coming along really well, actually. Nice. Um, the Xbox is pretty nice to develop for, I feel like. So I'm having, yeah, I'm having awesome. a lot of fun with it. What's the art overhead like? Uh, it's, it's not too bad. You know, working on a Aquaria really just kind of... <clears throat> Um, I just feel you. like it steeled me. Like my my drawing hand looks like one of Dan Tabar's abs. <laughs> <laughs> it's just ready to go, especially That's when awesome. it comes to drawing rocks. Yeah, all my games just have a shitload of rocks in them. It turns out, so I'm pretty pretty used to that. Nice. So what else is new in Derek Derek Uland? Do you have any big GDC plans, or is it just kind of a show up and hang out? kind of a deal for you this year. Yeah, I'm ready to show up and hang out. Um, I do have a talk. I do have a panel. Uh, oh, yeah, pump your panel, Ben. With me, Ben Reese, Flash That's Band's right. art director. That's, and, okay. <laughs> <laughs> That's the whole panel. I'm just going to talk about myself. And it's really funny because when, when they, uh, you know, they send me like an email about the, you know, saying the schedule had been set up showed like the, the, the panel page on the GDC website and according to the panel page, I don't know if it's still like that, but every single person on the panel works at Flashbang Studios. Oh my god, that's <laughs> awesome. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to pretend that's an error, but I think that should be deliberate. Did you check it out? Did you no, see if it's uh, it, still like that? Yeah, I was like, <laughs> Derek Hugh, Flashbang Studios, David Hellman, Flashbang Studios. Oh, and I wish Flash David Hellman nice. Flashbang. God damn it. I see how you guys god damn it. <laughs> What what's the uh the cuz I really want to like break open all of your guys' brains about art shit like what is the the most uncomfortable I could make you before you walk away <laughs> in the middle of the panel <laughs> the most uncomfortable yeah. you I, I mean in childhood <laughs> is it will, will that hit the nail like oh for what's art, the limit to where I can go before you're just, like fuck this panel no nah, man just just go deep I want to be oh, crying shit. by the end you know oh fuck yeah, go deep. Shit's gonna be off the meat rack. <laughs> <laughs> Man, I hope so. So, like, what what is your panel actually about, Ben? For people who have not been scouring the IGS lineup, which is probably not many people. Well, it's not about technology. Uh, I don't want to ask people about the the software they use or or what their their technical process is. I kind of want to see what's going on between here's my thought and. I'm actually sitting down at the computer doing art now. Like, like I want to know what motivates people, what gets them super excited, what bums them out, like what, what makes them get up and work on games. Because games does not really take care of most of us, but we continue to do it, and that, that's yeah. what I'm curious about. So it's a, it, it's a panel comprised 
solely of indie artists. Yeah, it's Derek and me and Edmund McMillan and David Hellman, the braid artist. Nice. Is yeah, Edmund so gonna make? Is Edmund gonna make it? Like, is he is he confirmed? Definitely gonna be there. I have to know. We, oh, yeah. we, we scheduled it as like the, the second to last session because he literally has trouble waking up a in the morning and he's also driving out on like the uh, yeah. So okay, we, cool. we deliberately scheduled it so that Edmund should in theory show up. But if yeah. not, you guys can well, do the thing where you like get a, a a black balloon and fill it with tar and then like have it pretend to be Edmund or something. I'm not. <laughs> <laughs> Just give me a fake around. beard and I'll take his place. <laughs> A fake beard and one kidney, or whatever it was. <laughs> well, a fake beard <laughs> and something that signifies that I don't have a gallbladder anymore. Uh, yeah, that's what it is. <laughs> <laughs> is this next game going to star a gallbladder? Actually, his current game stars a gallbladder. <laughs> oh, typical. It seemed like that whole experience would be pretty good for, you know, for, for Edmund's, like, creativity. Yeah. <laughs> the photos yeah, that were taken are pretty but... good. <laughs> So what's inspiring your your creativity, Derek? Like, what what's what are you looking to when you upscaled the art on Spelunky? Did you look at other games that were kind of moving away from like a retro look, or did you look outside of games and you know go to a, a museum or look at a certain period in time? Or what, um, did, you, what did you do? I, I feel you know I'm I'm bringing a lot of what I learned working on Aquaria to it, and yeah, I, I've been looking at I've been looking at other games that I feel like have. Um, do 2D, like, high-res art really well. Mm -hmm. um, definitely ripping off a lot of Meat Boy, Super Meat Boy. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, no, but, I, yeah, I've been looking at some... I've been looking at, uh, like, the Vanillaware games. Hell yes. You know, they're just so sick. Um, yeah. I haven't tried Muramasa yet, but I, I, I have Odin Super. Yeah. I'm actually replaying Odin's Fair right now, and it's still fucking gorgeous. Yeah, it's good. Um, oh, I checked out Wario Land Shake It, which has got kind of like a just like a real cartoon, cartoon style. Um, I'm going for more of a painted look, like an Aquaria. Nice. But it's going to be a little more like you know cartoony and and fun. So. I don't know how much you're allowed to say, but um, are there going to be? Do you plan on having new environments and shit like that in the new version? I think there's probably going to be like one new environment. Cool. Um, definitely want to have something in there for, for people who ex fully experience the original. Sure. Uh, and yeah, and then I'm going to keep probably just keep a lot of stuff the same, just with new arts and stuff like that. Badass. If it ain't broke. Yeah. yeah. For real. <laughs> yeah, I went through, you know, the original game went through quite a few iterations and everything, so I uh, got a lot of good feedback about it, so I feel like it's, it's at a pretty good point right now. How do you feel about the completely outrageous fanaticism people have about the game? I love it. I mean, it's just, it blows my mind, you know. I don't know, I, I, I watched a video someone made um, I, you know, I almost have to kind of stay away from it a little bit, but every now and then, you know, I'll, I'll watch a video or something that someone made. Well, wait, what do you mean? What do you mean stay away from it? I don't know. Like, I, it's the kind of thing where I really, I really appreciate it, but it almost, I almost don't want it to, anything to kind of keep me from the task at hand, which is just sure. making a good game, you know? It, it almost gets a little overwhelming, I guess. Huh. Um for me, I don't know. I, part of me, like, I, I really just have to separate uh, what I'm doing, what I'm focusing on in a way from, from you know, everything that's kind of going on, like, that's related to it, that's outside of actually working on it a little bit. I don't know. I don't know. I, I've, got, I've got some weird, some weird issues about that, <laughs> I guess. But, um, yeah, I do like... So, you know, there are like tons of videos out there, and, and I, I haven't seen too many of them, but every now and then I like to, to pop one on and yeah, check it out. It's just, it's awesome. Yeah. I saw one of some, some guy beating the game for the first time, um, like yesterday or like a couple of days ago, and it was just, it was great. Oh, yeah, he's just so tense. He's oh, so, so he was beating it for the first time. 
He was beating for the first time, yeah. Okay. He just had to, like, record it. Um, <laughs> he was freaking the fuck out. And he was freaking out. Cool. Yeah, and I was just like, this That's is awesome. awesome. This is so great. Is there, do you think there's a risk in getting too involved in, in the love for the game and then having it affect the game negatively because of it? Um, I think there can be. I think it just depends on, on, on how you handle it. You know, I just, uh, for me, it, it can just be, it's just like, it can be just like a really sort of, uh, sort of like an emotional experience to see that people are kind of connecting with something you made so strongly. And it's almost like, like, whoa, shit. You know, it's it's like huh. it's almost too much. Huh. That's how that's how I feel about it. I, I think it's kind of a, a weird way to feel, but um, no, that I makes mean, sense. It's it's probably a strange sensation, generally speaking. It is. It is. It's just kind of weird. I'm just. I guess it just makes me a little uncomfortable. Almost. You know, it's it's hard to get used to. Um, huh. But it feels. I mean, it's great. It feels great. Yeah. It's just. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I think that's just that's just something with me where where I I just feel like I can't be completely plugged into that, you know, or or else yeah, I I start to lose focus. Sure. That's interesting. So I'm I'm actually curious on the business side of things. I don't think you've really publicly spoken about the story of how it ended up on XBLA. Was that a thing where Microsoft approached you? Did you approach them? Was it the plan from, you know, the very conception of the project or did it kind of evolve as, hey, this project's really popular. Maybe I could put it on XBLA. It was not part of the plan at all. That's, that's kind of the interesting thing. Like, I just started, I just started, you know, I mean, I was just working on the game for a while and I really, was only ever planning on releasing this freeware. Um, and yeah, I mean, I just kind of worked on it to, to a point where, where uh, you know, I thought I'd like to get some feedback on it and I put it on, on TIG forums. And, um, you know, I think people, people liked it, uh, but it, it still took a couple iterations before, you know, people really started to, to kind of, to kind of get it, I guess. Um, yeah. What's the timeline like between, like, sort of how many weeks did you work on it, like, sort of full time or part time, until it got to the point where it was people were really starting to rave about Spelunky? Uh, yeah, I, I guess. Oh man, over over the summer of two thousand and eight, yeah, I I, I was working on it. Um, I wouldn't say like. Uh, like super full time, like you know, I was, uh, I wasn't like just spending twenty four hours a day on it or anything like mm -hmm. that. But but I was kind of I was I was definitely focusing on it, um, just because I was into I I was into the the concept and everything. Um, and then I think I released the first build publicly around in the fall, and then and then I think just. You know, because people were giving me good feedback, and and because it was out, it was public. I I started working on it pretty hard around then, just trying to get, yeah. you know, build after build out. It, it was really an interesting experience. It was kind of like a you know, a public beta test, which is not really what I intended in the beginning, um, but you know, people people were into it, so yeah, it kind of spurred me on. Do you think it was much easier for you to actually work on it because people were so into it? Like, if, if you had released it and it had just kind of been a lukewarm reception, would you, do you think you actually would have made that 34th iteration that started to really kick off? Uh, no, I don't think I would have, actually. I think that's one of the reasons why I released it when I did, was, you know, I, I kind of wanted to, to see what people thought of the idea. I mean, I, I did like the idea myself. I just, I really can't honestly say, like, if people weren't giving me so much feedback about the game that I, that I would have worked on it as, as yeah. gung ho as I did. So, um, yeah. yeah. There's a ton of different versions out there. And I was wondering, were they all based on feedback or were they things that you wanted to do for yourself or a combination of them? A lot of it was stuff that I, that I had planned on doing. Um, I mean, there, there definitely was a lot of, there were some ideas I think that that 
I just hadn't thought of that were good. But a lot of the, the ideas I ended up implementing were the ones that were really just kind of in line with what I thought, you know, the game should be all about and stuff like that. You know, like things okay. like people suggesting that you be able to pick up the monsters and throw them around. That was actually, you know, came in pretty late. Um, and yeah, I mean, that was just, that was an idea that I was already kind of uh, thinking about early sure. on, but that, you know, I just, I, I really, you know, I, I had just hadn't gotten around to implementing it until, until people were suggesting it. Did, did you put in anything that wasn't originally your idea that was just based on feedback? Um, yeah, I, I, I definitely think I did. I'm having trouble come, you know, thinking of uh, some specific examples right now. Okay. Yeah. Uh, I was just curious. Cause I'm, I'm curious about the process in general. Cause it's like, they do that with fighting games a lot. You know, it's like they, they iterate it based on player feedback and I'm just, I'm always curious if that's like a resentful process, you know, it's like, Oh Christ, I got to put this in for these fucking players so that they keep, putting quarters into this or whatever so right right yeah, i was just curious it's, it's a weird process you know there there was one guy early on who was um who was complaining a lot about the game he was just saying uh he kept just saying that it was too hard you know and he was getting pissed because he wasn't getting to enjoy the full experience of the game he felt okay. like steve swink what a what a bastard yeah that guy's a real <laughs> asshole i mean <laughs> Um, <laughs> but yeah, no, he, he was like, he was kind of saying that, you know, I, I was almost robbing him of, of the experience of playing the game, which to me felt kind of counterintuitive because, you know, it's, I mean, he's the one playing it, right? Like, <laughs> yeah, that's really strange. Like, like, I wonder if it was he operating from a position of like, well, all my friends are totally in love with this. And I want to be in love with it too, but I can't. Or I wonder if he was like, he could feel the fun at the edge of his fingertips, but like the hardness was in the way. Like, that's really weird. I think it's, a, I think it was a bit of both. I think it was a bit of both. So, you know, his suggestion was to add like a difficulty option, basically put in like an easy mode or like, you know, in, in NetHack and some of those roguelikes, there's like a wizard mode mm -hmm. that you can enter, it makes you invincible. Um, yeah. Something like that, and I really resisted that hard. Um, I mean, one of the things that was interesting, I thought, was that you know, he, I mean, he he kept playing the game, and, and he kept getting better at the game and seeing more of it as we were having this <laughs> this yeah. discussion. But he was still kind of like, "It's too hard. I shouldn't have had to work this hard to get um, where I am." The game, essentially, um, and you know, I don't know, I. I'm really glad that I didn't didn't uh, implement an easy mode because I think it was, it's just so counter to what the entire game was about. Right. And eventually, you know, his eventually, I think a lot of the, the the problems that he had with the difficulty were fixed. You know, not by adding an easy mode, but just because you know I was I was fixing bugs in the game and and kind of balancing things out in the game. Um, you know. In a, in a lot of other places. So that was definitely one of those cases where I think the guy may have had like a legitimate problem, but he was just not giving the appropriate solution to that yeah. problem, you know, where he, he himself just, just didn't know what was, what was really the problem I think with the game. Sure. He sure. just kind of wanted to put a bandaid on it. You know what I mean? Like, yeah, just, yeah. just make it easier. Well, you know, the, the reason why it's like, like, that he wasn't enjoying it wasn't because of the difficulty per se. It was because, um, you know, there are a lot of kind of little problems with the balance and the controls and their bugs yeah. and stuff like that. So that's kind of an interesting experience. Yeah, that's super that's cool. Probably, yeah. But was, uh, was it consciously difficult? I mean, was that something you intended from the start? I mean, not difficult, but I mean... You know, it's not an easy game. Like, was that intentional? Yeah, that was totally intentional. Um, awesome. I think I like difficult games. I mean, it's, uh, I don't know. I just I just get a lot more value from them generally, you know. Yeah, um, I, 
I remember something cool. I, I was trying to uh, one credit Raiden three at the same time you were trying to one credit Metal Slug three, nice. and I saw that on Twitter, and I'm just like, yes, I know Derek appreciates this shit because you know it feels <laughs> awesome, like getting over something that insanely Japanese. <laughs> yeah, it does, and it's really funny because you know, like a long time ago, you know, we have this, we had this arcade in Pasadena where I grew up um, with Tim Langdell. Nice. <laughs> We went to the same nursery school. It's kind of interesting. <laughs> really? No. He was, he was 30 when he was a... He was the teacher? He was the teacher. No, I, I did grow up in Pasadena where Tim Langell is from. But, um, uh, yeah, there's this arcade Pac-Man. I remember I, remember I played Metal Slug 3 at that wow. arcade. And a so friend good. and I, like, we had this giant cup of quarters that I think... My, my my parents had won it in Vegas. They just got lucky on the slots or something, and they just had this huge jar of quarters, and we took that to Pac-Man, and, you know, we credit-fed Metal Slug 3, and it, it felt fucking terrible. Yeah. It felt fucking terrible. So um, you, you feel like you've robbed yourself, kind of like, ah, oh, what am I doing, and you feel filthy. I did, and, you know, it's, you know, once you start kind of approaching a game like Metal Slug from – from the perspective of, you know, trying to, to one credit it, one, trying to get better at it, it completely changes the game. And it's so mm. interesting because, like, how much of the player's expectation kind of colors their experience, you know? Like, the same game, I played it two different ways, and, yeah, it, it meant, you know, two completely different things. Yeah, So absolutely. I don't know. Metal Slug 3, yeah, definitely. I mean, I definitely love just the... The action and the graphics when I played it the first time, but uh, oh shit, yeah. But then, yeah, once you try to one CC it, it, it just takes on a whole whole another level. I feel like, yeah, it's it's weird the relationship you start to form with a game while you one credit it. It's like when you start knowing what's around every corner and you know you you you're, you don't have the skill to do it yet but you know it's so awesome which is weird that spelunky came out as the random experience it did like it's almost like people get that exciting sensation every time and that's probably why people are into it so hard yeah it's interesting because the, yeah i think the the procedural the, the randomized element um I think one of the reasons why it works is because the you, even though it's random, you you can still get better at the game, and it's an uh, and it's an action game. Even um, mm -hmm. you know, like in a game like NetHack, for example, like a rogue, like um, you know, it's the it's more about I think just just knowing the game, you know, knowing knowing that when you do do this this will happen. So it was an interesting experience, you know, kind of translating that, you know, the randomness into an action game, then is it still going to be a game that's based on where skill matters, you know, or is it going to be more about like, you know, like a net hack memorizing how things work. And I think it, you know, it ended up, um, I think being a pretty good combination of both. Sure. But, but it's still a game where skill matters and that's really what I was trying to do. Yeah. So, I'm glad it worked out. Yeah, that's awesome. Sweet. I I I never got an answer, by the way, on the on the business thing. Did you oh, approach yeah. uh, XBLA or did they come to you? So that was so it was interesting. So yeah, the game getting the freeware game was getting more popular, and I was still working on it. Like, um, pretty. I was working on it pretty actively, uh, well into uh, 2009, I think. But um, yeah, regarding the Microsoft, it was actually John Blow that ended up um, putting me in touch with them. And then oh. from there, I went into, I went through the whole, you know, the whole process. But yeah, John, John's actually was, you know, he's actually a big, big fan of the game. And he was really helpful for, for getting, getting all this going. He's a really generous guy. That's totally awesome. So it's, yeah, definitely. Definitely, I you know I think he's a guy who who has you know obviously had a lot of success in the in the indie sphere, but um, he's uh, yeah I feel like he really went out on on a limb. Yeah, so, I th I, th I think John is very opinionated, but he definitely cares a lot about games, 
and a lot about games that he thinks he are good, which is I, pretty much most games that are good. Yeah, I, yeah, I, I, I really appreciate that because you know I don't, I, I don't, I honestly don't know how. Um, yeah, you know, I, I honestly don't know whether Microsoft would have would have noticed it. Uh, yeah, yeah. Otherwise, so nice. Well, that answers my question. So yeah, to move sorry on, about that. <laughs> to move on from the Spelunky business, uh, I, I, I guess like the next logical destination is Tig Source. And yeah, if you want to talk about like the latest and greatest Tig Source drama, maybe. I love Tick talking about Tig Source drama. drama. <laughs> <laughs> we should just name the show like the Tig Radio Drama Show. <laughs> So, they all disgust me. <laughs> yeah. All, all of the all of the Tig Source peoples. Yes, every one of them. <laughs> you super meat baby, shut up. <laughs> <laughs> oh God, I love Arthur. We, yeah, we, maybe, we, maybe we, I should, maybe I should just take criticism from him. Yeah, that was my main problem. Is I didn't know how to take Arthur Lee's criticism. Which is just bitching, as I said, bitching. I I hope he's at, at uh, GDC. I'm yeah, you know, to- I hope he is too. I mean, I'm gonna do everything in my power <laughs> to make that kid feel so out of place. Oh. It'd be awesome. I, I mean, yeah. Last year at GDC, I, I you know, I I mean, I, I let the guy into my fucking house, and I just feel like <laughs> I gave him a beer, you know. I gave him yeah. one of my Tecates, and, and <laughs> I thought everything was cool. It seemed like uh, uh, everything was cool. I don't know. Once he gets on the internet, it's like, you know, Incredible Hulk. Like, Yeah, he, he has a very different internet personality, which I think is, is dangerous. Yeah. I, and I don't know. I, I try to be fairly consistent. And I, I don't know if that's just uh, – he's younger, right? I mean, he's not quite upper 20s. Or I think he's like in his early twenties or something like that. Yeah, I actually think, I think part of it's honestly that I developed my personality on the internet, like on IRC back in high school. So to me, it's not like I behave the same online as I do in real life. It's more like I behave the same in real life as I do online. But you would I'm, think that would be more. Uh, anyway, that's kind of a tangent. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, it's just. Uh, you know, I mean, he's talking about things that people are serious about, and it's just, you know, you can't tell whether he's being serious or not, so. Yeah, yeah. I'd rather just discuss this kind of stuff with him in person. Yeah. So do, do you want to talk about, like, what your intent was on this fracturing thread? Which, if I can make a quick summation, it was you posting a history of what you thought was the indie movement, where, where it started, where it went, and where it is today, and then what you saw is sort of a splinter group of some indies are more about production and mainstream accessibility, and other indies are about, no, you should push the new, you should push the unusual, you should push something else, even if it hurts accessibility. Is yeah. that a proper summation? or is- that's, a pretty, that's a good summation. I, you know, I think pe- people got the mistaken... Um, impression that I was trying to like sum up indie history or something and I yeah, really yeah. wasn't because you know I, I I definitely left out 90% of, of what's out there you know because I was mostly focused on you know kind of how um, how I got started you know where Tig Source was where Tig Source went and then where it seemed to me like like things might be going um, yeah yeah, and, and I do remember that that really big rift between indie and casual because a lot of people from dexterity slash indie gamer were were kind of working on casual games, and there was a lot of well, casuals were targeted, and like that that really big split between oh, you're an indie five person studio, like why are you working on a casual game? And it feels like that that kind of strife has vanished in the last couple of years. Like nobody really cares anymore. Yeah, it definitely has. I mean, that was one of the things I noticed, which was kind of funny, was that. Um, you know, some of these people who are railing on Tig Source and stuff, I, I, you know, I just, it reminded me of a lot of the, the stuff that was said on Tig Source about casual games, like early on, you yeah. know, like, I definitely, how was that? Christ. Was that, was that Tommy? That wasn't oh, no, me. that was, that was, that was my house. I think my mom <laughs> dropped something. I'm I'm down here visiting them right now. My dad. Uh, classic moms. 
yeah, I, I couldn't tell exactly. What I was. Shattering all the china. Um, she she sounds like she's doing okay though, so we'll keep talking about it. Next time. <laughs> cool. Get out to check on her. Anyway, Take back to Ukraine is much more important <laughs> than, than, than the latest and greatest in tick source drama. Yeah. Um, what was I saying? What was I saying? Um, something about history of the game world and like sort of the 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 critique on TIG Source today is a lot like the critique on Casual. And it's weird to me that there is, is, is even like a concerted anti-TIG Source effort. Like it's an internet forum run by volunteers. It's not that hard to influence it if you, if you want to change it. Yeah, no, I mean, that was, that was something I didn't really understand. So, I mean, that was one of the things I was hoping would get brought up in that thread. Um, and it did. People, some people were saying that, uh, you know, Arthur included that I, TIG source, you know, just by virtue, I guess, of its of its popularity has, you know, destroyed smaller communities, which... Uh, it's the Walmart of the indie game forum it's world. It's the Walmart <laughs> of the indie game forum world. And I don't know, I just, I can't feel too bad about that. Uh, I just, I mean, I, it's, I'm glad that people are, are, are really expressing, you know, what they feel is wrong with it, though. Um... And yeah, I think there are a lot of parallels to early TIG source, which is why you know I, I kind of yeah, put yeah. it in the in the timeline. And you know, I think the thing about TIG source is that um, once once things did, you know, once indie developers uh, started getting more successful, the whole rift between casual games, I just I think feel like that's one of the reasons why it became a lot less substantial. You know, it's like. How, how can you complain when, when like, you know, Ron Carmel and, and Kyle at TD Boy or, or people like that are doing so well, you know? I mean, I, how can I, you know, I, I have a hard time getting, getting um, you know, ups, as you know, going on those kinds of tirades like I, I did before just because I, I feel like uh, things are just, you know, going so well for, for um Quite, you know, people in the community, and you know, someone brought up in the thread that like, well, still the majority of indie developers are not, uh, you know, not even able to make a living doing it, or you know, they don't even, you know, they don't care about being able to make a living from it, and I think yeah. that's that's totally understandable. I just feel like, um, yeah, I don't know, I don't know. It's interesting. Yeah, it it, it is kind of. There was that tone to me back in the casual indie split of that there was this big opportunity available with the digital distribution and download stuff, and it was being squandered on casual. Right, it's getting kind of choked out a bit by yeah, and casual it, games, right? Yeah, it was just like, that's what they're going to use this opportunity for, is to make more Match 3 games. And I feel like that's a little bit different today, where it's kind of a given that you can just put your game online even if it's not on Steam or any other site, just you know, put it online and get some buzz for it and then start selling it. So it, it feels like the, the whole, oh, I guess you know, it's okay if Big Fish does their thing in their corner of the world because it doesn't really affect the opportunity for you know, six Vs or whatever to do well. Right, yeah. I mean, I also think that you know, just the, the separation, I think, between the, you know, our, you know, that question of whether casual games are games or not is just kind of just seems kind of moot now like i think when people say talk about indie games i i, I don't think they're thinking about you know like big fish and portals like that i think they're thinking about like you know world of goo and yeah and yeah. uh crayon physics and and stuff like that so um yeah i don't know i just yeah there, things there's... seem like they're going well so it's just like it, it just seems almost stupid to have like a rant about casual games on the front page of Tick Source anymore. Yeah, it feels like it's a totally separate bubble. And yeah, yeah. there's, there's actually a, before the IGS, there was Simon always did a, a roundtable for the Independent Games Festival stuff, kind of like an indie roundtable in general every year. Uh -huh. And one year we were a finalist with Glowworm, which was basically a really kind of artsy casual game. I mean, it was, it, was, it was aimed at the casual game market, and we were an IGF yeah, yeah, finalist yeah. for Art and Audio. And there was, this is before I knew Reagan, but there was, at the roundtable, Reagan stood up, and he had this rant about 
he thought it was bullshit that there was a casual game in the IGF and it was solely in the IGF. And I actually kind of like raised my hand after and I was like, so yeah, that's us. And we're, <laughs> we're like three dudes. And one of our dudes yeah. has a huge beard. Like, how is that not super indie? I, I don't know. It was just kind of awkward because I was like, wow, you know, people are really angry about this, this split. And it, it feels like that people are still angry about stuff today, but it's not about casual. It's about, oh, I'm angry about. And I, what, what's weird to me is I, I have a hard time like rephrasing or kind of summarizing the complaints people have like what is their complaint of like the new wave as you described it in the thread is it that people are spending too much time on polishing a game even if it's you know quote just a platformer or they're not it, it, focusing it really too much on the seems new? to have to it, i mean it really the split really seems to just be between big and small i i that really seems like it i mean uh i don't yeah i don't know between big and small between commercial and freeware i think that's that's kind of where the next the next split is, um, which seems which seems a lot more arbitrary to me than you know the difference between casual and and indie I guess you know because I just don't feel like um, I don't know I, I guess there is that idea that you know once you're making a game for for money it's just inevitably going to be a little more mainstream or something like that I don't know. It, yeah, is, I, it is hard to put into like a single statement. <laughs> yeah, I, I would actually be curious if, because so far it seems like the, the new wave-ish people haven't really identified themselves as a connected, concerted movement. It would be interesting to see somebody like Auntie Pixel Auntie produce a statement that's, this is what we stand for. I mean, right. I, I finally replied to that thread with my statement. That's basically like, just if you care about X, just focus on X and don't you know, why care about whatever, you know, Joe is working on or build down the hall. I like, just work on your own stuff. Yeah. And yeah. I felt like that was kind of a, an anti-statement to the whole, it doesn't really matter. I mean, to use religion as a, well, this is probably a bad comparison, but to use religion <laughs> as a metaphor, like that, you know, I don't think there's an absolute truth in religion. It's like, if you believe in a God and that guides your life and you feel like you're happier, you're, ha you know, more power to you. And if you're an atheist and you don't believe in a God and you feel like that guides your life and makes you happier, more power to you. But there's the there's the statement in religion of like the, you know the, the the really hardcore atheist that tolerance is actually bad. Like if you're an atheist and you even tolerate religion, you're causing harm. And I feel like that's kind of the evangelical statement that people are making in the tick source movement, where it's not just oh if, if you really care about innovation, more power to you. It's more if you don't care about innovation, you're actually like tolerance of non-innovation is actually in in and of itself harmful. Like if you tolerate games that aren't pushing. The boundaries, then you're basically going to like you're responsible for crap. Yeah, yeah. I mean, um, it it seems it yeah. It just seems like it's kind of the antithesis of uh, independent development to have such a narrow view of what independence means. I don't know. Yeah, the whole like indie equals innovation thing. Um, uh, I don't know. I, it's constrictive. It, yeah, it's like, constructive. Yeah, it's yeah. The, constructive. the way that I was doing it more recently is like if if the the possibility space for self expression is so narrow that you it's only feasible by doing something new. Like if if you're not doing something new, you you cannot express yourself, and you can't you know it, there's 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 no worth there. I feel like then games are worse off than I thought before. Like if I want to express myself by making another platformer, but in in sort of the way that I would make a platformer, I think there's room there. Like there's not a lot of room, but there's wiggle room. Like there's room for an identity in, you know, quote just another Mario clone or whatever the fuck. Right. I mean, it also needs to be said that like platformer is such a huge genre. I mean, that's <laughs> Yeah. It it's really like just uh I don't know. It, it's such a it's such a broad genre. There's so much that can be done within it, and um, I don't know to have a problem with a, a game being. I mean, the, I think the problem is that you know when people start talking about uh, this kind of stuff, like I think they they I don't know. It, it gets into a lot of kind of subtle um, subtle differences between things and. And I think that that inevitably makes the the discussion more difficult. Yeah, I I think a lot of it. I'm I'm fond of pasting this Paul Graham essay on identity when I talk about this stuff because I I think a lot of it's that people view 
they they closely tie like the importance of innovation into their identity. So if somebody on the forums is like, oh yeah, here's my new awesome you know whatever platformer, and people praise it, like if their identity is tied so closely to new is super important, and there are people out there praising something that's not really new, like not super new, I think it it hurts them. Like they have a hard time maintaining that identity. Like if your identity is that Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior and all of your friends yeah. are you know, joking about atheism <laughs> and having a good time of it, like it's hard to maintain that identity in face of all of this sort of, oh, people are praising not something that's my identity. So I don't know. I, I, th I think people closely tie it in to their identity far too much. And then when somebody else has a different point of view, it's not like, oh, okay, okay, that's your different point of view. I mean, like, like as I said in the thread, I, I feel like too many discussions boil down to, oh, I disagree with you, so therefore you must be wrong, as opposed to, oh, I disagree with you, isn't that interesting? Like, we, like there's a different way to look at it, as opposed to, oh, if I disagree with you, then clearly either you're wrong or I'm wrong, and obviously the way that everything works is like, well, it's not me, because that's part of my identity, that's who I am, like, you must be wrong. I don't know. Right, yeah, I mean, these, these arguments definitely get really personal at times, and I think I, it m makes it really hard to find um, find out what what's really kind of at the, at the heart of the issue. I feel like so. Yeah, it's, it's a difficult dis you know it's a difficult it's a difficult question, and and people are going to be struggling with it. I'm if like a new site came came up that's uh, if a new site came up that's about this these, you know, so-called, these like super small uber indie indie games and was solely focused on that, I think that'd be great. Uh, it's just, I'm just wondering why those, why a site like that hasn't come up yet and why, you know, well, you know, there's pig scene, right? But I feel <laughs> like that, that site is more just, uh, it's more just about making fun of people on tick source than actually celebrating what's good about yeah, I I feel like pig scene is too muddy. It's not clearly satire, and it's too bitter. It has too much vitriol to be good satire. So to me, it feels like it doesn't point out the absurdity of some of the stuff in Tig Source as well as it could have if it wasn't so freaking personal. Like, right. I feel right. like if it were more ridiculous, then it would do a good job of like, oh, people really care about this? Like they're arguing about that? That's retarded. But it, it dips too much into the personal attack to where it's like, oh, well, now I can't tell if it's satire or if it's just like a thinly veiled way for Arthur to vent on the internet. Yeah, it's hard to tell what the objective of the site is. Yeah. Um, you know, I mean, you can't even tell if, if when they do have uh, mm -hmm. legitimate reviews about, yeah. about small games, whether they're making fun of the games or not. And I think that's the whole point of that site. So I yeah, guess yeah. what I'm saying is that I'd like to see a site that takes those uber indie yeah freeware games like really seriously and covers nothing but that yeah and like the the barrier to entry on the internet like we we did tig radio when we were basically like wow this other radio show sucks like why don't we do a better one and the barrier to entry to like doing an internet radio show today is basically zero it's like oh well just here's the workflow let's do it so i mean the barrier to entry to like oh let me get a blogspot account or a tumblr account and start just pasting links to really cool games and like two lines of why they're so cool. Like if you did that regularly, people would pick up on it. Like, you know, it would start being followed by blogs and rock, paper, shotgun and other sort of thought leader blogs that would be like, oh, okay, well this game got picked up here and it's really neat. Yeah, it definitely would be. And, you know, I think indiegames.com does a, uh, you know, Tim and Michael Rose, I think they do do a really good job of, yeah. of covering those types of games. But, you know, I, I'd like to see it. I, I think a site that has more analysis of exactly what makes those games so good as opposed to uh, just, you know, posting the games essentially um, and describing what they're about. And, and, you know, I'd like to see a site that is solely focused on those games. I think there's definitely a place for that. And, yeah, when I started that thread, I, I was definitely not trying to imply that fracturing is bad. I was yeah, yeah. more trying to imply that it was a fact of life, um, and that I just thought it was, it's just really in, interesting to see how, you know, how things repeat themselves and also how things are, are different. Because I see that, 
you know, this new wave is a lot like early tick source in a lot of ways, but I also see that it's different in a lot of ways. So yeah, yeah, it would be, it would just be great if, you know, people in that sort of mindset, um, really started to be proactive about it as opposed to, uh, you know, I feel like a lot of the, a lot of these kinds of ideas, they do start off as being very reactionary towards the, you know, perceived status quo, but, um, you know, right now it just feels like it's still kind of hanging onto the wall and it really just needs to push off and kind of become its own thing if it, if it wants to be that. So. Yeah, I, I think just in general, it's really easy to be motivated against something than it is to be motivated for something kind of out in the open. Like it's really easy to rail against something and it's not quite as easy to, to kind of just, oh, I think this is important. I'm going to try to somehow hammer on this. So, yeah, I mean, it's easier to have like that villain that they're kind of railing against than just, uh, yeah. Right, yeah. The one thing that really bugs me when I see threads like that, and I, I have this too, like in, in fun motion forums, I really want there to be deep discussion on the nature of physics-based games and not just like these, these threads by 14-year-olds that are kind of lol friendly. But at the same time, it's like I realize that if I want to see that, I should be doing it myself. And I haven't posted those kinds of threads. I haven't started them. I haven't tried to steer a thread into a more deep discussion by posting like a three-paragraph sort of here's why I think this game is better than that game. And... and at the same time, it's like when I see these TIG threads, it's just like if someone has a comment, they're like, oh, I wish there would be discussion like this. And I, you just like click their find all post by this person. You're like, oh, I don't see you doing that. Like, it's just No, that's it's, really true. It's yeah. best to lead by example. It's like, and I always try to do that myself. It's like if I don't have anything that I, – I, I read a lot of threads that I never post in because it's just like, well, I'm not going to really add to this. And if I do have something like, oh, I, I think it should be more like – I should see posts that are more optimistic. Like, okay, let me write an optimistic post then because it's the only way you're ever going to see it is if you start to do it yourself no it's true i mean especially like on the tick source front page you see a lot of people that are i mean one of my biggest pet peeves about the tick source front page like the commenters is that they will extrapolate like one week of posts into forever yeah. you know they'll we'll, we'll post three art games in a week for example and they'll be and they'll be like tick sources posting you know nothing but art games for forever they've always been like that they you know <laughs> they never post anything but art games when it's you know the people are really basing it on literally the last week of posts yeah and then you find people saying you know complaining about stuff that you know it really just all the complaints kind of cancel each other out because it's like too many commercial games too many art games too many you yeah, know, yeah. Of games and um, yeah, I, I really just want people to say, you know, even if you do feel like TigSource is posting too many art games, post, like, there are too many art games, why aren't you covering this game link, this game link, this game link, et cetera, you know? Yeah, and it should, even beyond that, they, I mean, any, anybody that's really like, why aren't you covering, you know, interactive fiction, like, that person could just email you, I'm sure, I'm going to just speak for you here real quick, but they could email you, like, here's my review of here's my roundup of like the five greatest interactive fiction games and you would probably just post it like if you want to see something covered like write up a review for it and you know actually volunteer it yeah people have been posting well the funny thing is you know uh after uh i think you know after the the igf um bitching thread or something i i i wanted to make it so that it was easier to post articles directly to tick source i basically decided like if you're gonna if you're gonna make a post uh like i write a guest article i just i'd post it if it was well written yeah um and yeah you know i mean i i did that for a week and it was actually it was great because we had a lot of different opinions and and i was also really busy at the time so i, I couldn't update the site as much and oh and we also got fuzz alex mcqueen on the on the front page and yeah then people were you know, complaining about the fact that there are so many guest uh, guest writers who didn't know what they're talking about, and and yeah, and I think it was Arthur who was who was basically you know asked like what the what the uh, the usual editors, aka me, were were up to if they're just let you know making all these guest guest writers write <laughs> the site, letting so. all these noobs post. Yeah, letting all these noobs post. So, I don't know. It's, it's, it's difficult to run. 
it's difficult to run a website, I think, that that covers the indie game scene because there are so many different opinions about what indie games is. Yeah, I, it's probably easier to run a, a blog that's like, here's my shooter blog or here's my platformer blog because you're not going to get as much dissonance and like, wait, yeah. that's an indie game? Like, that's not an indie game because I care about, you know, adventure games. Like, oh, well, there are, there are, there's more to that. Like, I don't know, that, that was the one thing that I'm disappointed with now is that people aren't as op- open to like, oh, well, I really care about, you know, retro adventure games and you really care about that. As opposed to saying that's great, it seems like a lot of people have the knee-jerk reaction like, wait a minute, one of us is an indie and it sure as hell isn't me. I don't know. Yeah, I mean, it's possible that, you know, things are are just, you know, indie is kind of just, it's big enough that people are now uh, finding niches within it that they that they just become focused on, you know, so it would be, yeah, so it, it it's tough to, uh, it's, it's tough to cover everything, and, and I would really like to see sites dedicated just to retro platformers or shoot 'em ups or stuff like that. Maybe, yeah. maybe they exist, you know. I mean, so much stuff just kind of flies over or under my radar these days. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah. it's a great bit. it's a great thing. I, I actually I I love the tick drama to be honest. You know, um, it's I, I'm glad that people care. It's a lot better than the alternative and and we and you know, we always end up learning a lot <laughs> from yeah. these character building uh arguments i think it's admirable how how unfazed you seem like you'll you'll do a post and there'll be a lot of personal attacks against you and you you don't really like kind of rise to the bait and start flaming people you're just like yeah well i i learned a lot in this thread you mean thanks for your opinion guys like you 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 manage to take the high road in a really chill kind of way which i think is admirable you know reasonable derek i've just been i've been on the internet like a long time you know uh and it's it still really takes a lot of willpower, I think, not to um, you know in, engage some of these some of these flame wars. But um, in the end, you know, people are expressing their opinion because they do they do care, and yeah. they and and I don't know. Like I said, it, I, yeah, I guess you do kind of build up a thick skin. Um, over yeah, the I've, internet. I've always tried to look at it as like the the opposite of love isn't actually hate; it's apathy. Like right. when when somebody doesn't care enough to rant about how much the IGF sucks or whatever, like that's when the IGF is in like in actual trouble, like yeah. in existential trouble, not as in kind of definition trouble of well, maybe you should focus on X more than Y or Y more than X, but like oh, it's not relevant anymore because nobody gives a shit. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. So, yeah. Keep, definitely drama is better than no drama. Yeah. That's how I feel about it. So um, how does your GDC look? Are you looking uh, biggest indeed GDC yet? Or any any specific thoughts? You know, I think it is going to be it is going to be biggest. Um, I think everyone thinks that like I, I mentioned this a little in the in my 2009 wrap up post, but uh, I felt like for a while, I felt like 2008 was Indy's biggest year, and I think a lot of people feel that way about 2008. You know, that was the year of uh, like crayon physics and World of Goo and yeah. Braid and stuff like Castle Crashers and stuff like that. Um, so, it, in a way, I kind of felt like 2009 was a bit of a lull at first, but but then yeah, when I was writing up that post and I was kind of going through all the things that happened. It really wasn't. It, it was a really, actually a really big year, you know. And a lot of great games came out. A lot of cool tools came out. Yeah, they're, they're an amazing amount of tools that people are just releasing for free, like uh, you know, Adam and and with Flixel and Chevy yeah, Ray yeah. and uh, Doctor Petter, you know, yep. releasing all kinds of cool stuff. So, he's so yeah, I think yeah, he is. He's definitely <laughs> got that Swedish magic the, the yeah. direct descendant of you know loki or something in, <laughs> in his veins um yeah i think 2000 i think 2010 is going to be it's going to be big yeah it, it it definitely like the one thing that feels different to me is if you look at igf winners from 
kind of right at the Gish era, like in the first six years versus the, like the second six years. Like the people that were winning the IGF have kind of vanished. Like they're not around anymore. And the people that have been winning the IGF and in general being very successful indies in the last three years are still around. And they're they're working very actively to support indie. You know, people like John Below and Ron Carmel are actually still working on their own games, but then also using their newfound resources to help other people, as you mentioned. And I, I right. think that's the big difference now is that indies starting to accelerate in that the indies that succeed are still around, still in the community, still, you know, going to game jams and the conferences. And then there's this new crop of people that are always just, you know, coming up, the people that no one's ever heard of yet that are starting to network with the old people. And I think that's the big difference from before is where before it was more kind of like you went indie and you, you did okay. And maybe you won the IGF, maybe you had a game and then you kind of just vanished. And I think now there's a much more entrenched network that's starting to really grow. Right. Yeah. It's definitely becoming a web. And yeah, these these successful indies, I, I do, you know, I, they do do a lot for the community and for other indies. Um, I mean, yeah, these guys are just, they're really pretty generous with their, yeah. with their time and everything. So it's cool. I mean, yeah, I, I think people really just, they just really care about, about the community, which is, um, which is awesome. I mean, that's what one of the big reasons why it's such a such a great place to be. It's because you you do become part of this this interconnected network. Yeah, yeah. And I want people to feel like that. Like you know, regardless of whether they're trying to make a game to win IGF or or whether they're going to make you know just a freeware game to to show other people. So. Yeah, I mean, I I do, uh, I always do hope that the community will stay as open as it has been and as welcoming. Where if you just show up out of nowhere and you post a cool project, and you you know post a cool, like some feedback to some other games, and then take some feedback from some games, and then all of a sudden you're you're part of a community where you're hanging out on Skype and you're drinking at GDC and whatever. I feel like yeah. that's the ideal, and I I do worry sometimes that it's getting a little bit too elitist. Not well, just in general, too, too bitter and too kind of caustic. Like you're gaining social credence, social credit in the community by, by being really angry and pointing out so many faults. Like that's, what's getting you social capital. I feel like that's a risky way for it to go versus you're getting social capital because you're saying positive, enthusiastic things and you've encouraged somebody to do something. I think like as long as the community gives more capital for that, I think we're okay. Yeah. I mean, it definitely, uh, I think it, it, you know, it definitely shows at GDC that, um, I mean, every year the, uh, just the group of people at GDC just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and everyone's, you know, so friendly and welcoming and it really doesn't matter. Um, yeah. What, what, what your objective is, you know, as long as you're into games, that's kind of, that's kind of the only requirement. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think the one thing that I do see in the forums, and I'm actually not really against this, is that to have any kind of opinion, you have had to have created something. People that show up and have not had any kind of project to their name, but still have all these like really vocal opinions, I think they got kind of ignored. Yeah. Like, the one thing that gets you a lot of social capital is the ability to point to a project and say, like, oh, I, you know, I made this game this, like, for this game jam or this game for this weekend, or here's my previous project. I think, okay, well, yeah, I mean, and I know I do it personally. I'm like, if, if I see somebody who's posting something, it, it, there is that kind of like, well, wait a minute, what have they done? Like, because that's going to provide a lot of context to their feedback right now. Yeah, it does. It does. Um, I mean, I think that's, that's why, you know, you just, you want to encourage people to, to make a game because I think make, trying to make a game really colors your opinions about, about, games and about game making specifically so yeah sweet well we have like a minute left in the show so do you have any parting words wow that went really fast yeah it's an hour (laughs) who's your favorite flashbang employee (laughs) ah geez definitely the one that's going to give me the most blowjobs at gdc oh shit (laughs) (laughs) dead stepping up Can can i can i join flashbang 
<laughs> didn't have the flash. Yeah, I, actually, uh, I I did go to the page and it's still listed as like Derek U Flashbang Studios, David Hellman Flashbang Studios. Just leave it. <laughs> <laughs> not, not, not fix it. Just no, leave I, it. I'll, I'll, I'll send an email. <laughs> interviewing all the artists I work with. Haha, <laughs> take it, chumps. Anyway. Oh, you're the only artist. I see what you did there. No, well, I'm saying I'm, I'm interviewing the artists I work with because that would be hilarious. Uh, <laughs> <as a panel. laughs> Especially if they were like your 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 sub- subordinates. So hey. subordinates. <laughs> what do you think about the art direction you get? It is fantastic. <laughs> oh goodness. Oh, by the way, who won the Super Bowl? That's that's my parting. That's my parting I don't shot. Know. Oh shit, Super Bowl. I don't know. The New know. York Knicks. Nice. <laughs> yeah, the Knicks were doing good. It was the it was the uh, Oakland A's. Well, thank you very much for your time, Derek. Thanks. That was a lot of Thanks, fun, Derek. Uh, feel free to stick around for our drunken after show, which if you are listening live. Uh, I guess you will know about it. If you aren't listening live, we do have a hour after the show. We stay broadcasting on Ustream, but don't record it. And we just get more drunk, oh. talk about things. Uh, Drunker. If you are listening now and not following our Twitter or Facebook, you can go to tw- twitter.com slash TIGRadio or facebook.com slash TIGRadio to get updates on who our next guest will be. We air every Sunday at 6 o'clock PST. Special thanks to our guest, Derek Yu, tonight. TIG Radio is put on by Matthew Wagner, Ben Reese, and Tommy Refinis. TIG Radio theme song by Danny Baranowski. TIG Radio website by Kyle Pulver. TIG Radio is proudly sponsored by absolutely nobody. See you next week.